folks, today we are going to talk about uh, generalizability and research systems. I'm going to break this lecture into a couple of different chunks, but that's where we're going to go today. Also, I'm trying out a new setup. Hopefully it's not awful. My, my goal is to minimize the need for multiple cameras and having them sync them across systems. So we'll see. I also got this uh, pretty neat um, microphone thing. So hopefully this will make everything less awful. Yeah, we, we need to give way more credit to YouTubers who have to deal with this all the time. Anyway, yeah, so those are the two chunks we're going to cover. First chunk is generalizability. Now, the book makes this argument that there's this distinction between reliability and validity and that it's really fuzzy. It's not. I fundamentally disagree with uh, David Bunder on this. I think I've told you. I haven't seen him at a conference lately. But I remember having this conversation with him. Someone around his age about this. Anyway, um, Flunder argues that it's a fuzzy distinction and raises questions like how much of a test can be changed before it becomes a different test? Um, and like how can assessments of reliability become assessments of validity? I would argue that it's not this fuzzy. Um, generalizability is that is where there's a really clear demarcation. I would argue that internal validity and reliability are fuzzy, but not external validity, like we talked about last time. Now, generalizability falls under external validity, and that's this idea of um, the degree to which a measurement or results of an experiment applies to other tests, other situations, other people. So does your study, does whatever your association, generalize beyond your specific study? Can you apply this to other places? Can you ex extrapolate it? And I think that's a really important question. And a lot of studies have generalizability issues when you just even look at the types of participants. Most, most research studies in psychology uh, look at college students because they're convenient. They're literally everyone in the first year, like in the Psych 101, or 151. I'm not exactly 100% sure what the, uh, the, the number is, but intro psych. But even though they're convenient, uh, college students are generally more affluent, liberal, healthier, younger. They're less likely to belong to an ethnic minority or really any kind of minority. Now, in psychology, we have another issue with gender distribution because unlike in the real world where it's about 50-50 men versus women, and if you were, uh, so if we were in class, you would notice that about 70% of your class males or female. In early psychology, and you may have noticed in the Milgram study that there was only one sample of women as a novelty. In studies pre-1970s, um, most of psychology was primarily male participants. Post-1970s, as the uh, distribution of gender has changed in our major, women have become more predominant. And it's almost a problem now because there are so many more women than men in our subject pools. Now, in addition to that, there are, there are more uh, kind of nuances. So women are also more likely to volunteer and show up at studies. So, and those can be important differences beyond just the proportion of our sample. Are, are women importantly different from men is the comp they have written here. And is that why they're more likely to show up? And also, are the men who volunteer and show up importantly, meaningfully different from the men that don't. So this 
becomes a broader issue with shows versus no shows. There's a problem if in a, if for pe in studies of people if if these groups are fundamentally different. So if the people who show up to a study are fundamentally different from the people who don't show up, then any finding we have, we can only extrapolate to other people who would be willing to show up. So, um, and this can also be a problem if you're interested in what's a, a behavior that is related to that no-showing. So if you're studying punctuality, for example, but can only use p participants who show up within 15, within five minutes of starting the experiment, you've lost a huge chunk and honestly a bigger, more interesting part of your study. Those people, what if they show up at six minutes, 20 minutes? Those are kind of a different fundamental kind of person than um, those that don't, sh that do show up on time or early. And ideally you want to study where the reasons that people are in the study are versus not in the study are like just totally arbitrary, totally random. Like that there was an equal likely chance that you were in the study versus not in the study. I mean, it doesn't have to be equally likely for you specifically, but you compared to everyone else. One kind of cutesy anecdote, and I think we're going to talk about this in a bit, is my rule of thumb is if you would have participated or could have participated in the study, it probably applies to you like whatever the finding is. Now, before I get too far ahead of myself, because I like to do that, as you've probably already figured out, um, we also have the issue, and I hinted at this a smidge, of ethnic and cultural diversity. So most research is on white middle-class college students. And if we broaden this a little, most of these, it's mostly people who are weird. Now when I say weird, I'm saying weird in all caps, W-E-I-R-D. Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. So about, I think it's about 80% of, it used to be worse, but I think around now it's about 80% of psychology studies are on weird samples. And there are some really cool studies that, and we'll talk about kind of the cultural diversity that expands when you go beyond weird samples, um, but it, if you limit yourself only to the people who are available in your research pool, if you don't try and find studies that are like data set, like samples of people that are nationally representative or representative of more than just white college students, you're going to have a hard time generalizing and seeing if your study applies to other situations. So I think that the burden of proof uh, should be that, oh, my screen is blocking the key keynote that I need to uh, read here. So in general, there's a, real, there's a decent burden of proof for um, seeing how a study can apply to other people. I would really discourage like oversimplistic generalizations and just saying, oh, of course this will apply to other groups um, or even people of other times. So studies done in the 1950s, a lot of my work using a sample that started in, 19, in the 1930s, it's a, it's a question of CO, even though they're white Americans, they're all so white, it was New England in the 1930s, but they're from a different time, and so many of the effects, there are weird gender effects that I wouldn't generalize beyond the 1930s where women, like, you just couldn't have, I mean, you could have a job, but it, you had a lot of societal pressure not to, and so um, in general, so while, right, okay. So while like there, you like don't overgeneralize is kind of my key thing here. Now, Funder and I again have a big disagreement. He argues that if you're going to question generalizability of a study, you should propose when, how, and why it doesn't generalize. 
so his his idea is that we assume it applies to everyone unless um, proven otherwise. I I personally prefer kind of a more conservative approach. My assumption is that the study does not generalize unless you can make the case that it should. Like, you need to sell me on why your study generalizes beyond the college student population of wherever. So, unfortunately, this is not the norm, and you'll get really strange pushback from reviewers if you use kind of a non-standard sample, because then they'll question the generalizability. And I have many thoughts on this, so I encourage you to hop into my office hours, and I'm happy to ramble more about how there's a strange assumption about what is typical. And everything else we need to... Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm getting a little grumpy, too. So I'm going to just keep going that my personal assumption, my personal default assumption is that nothing generalizes and that you have to make a decent case. Now, not like totally on general. Like, it's, I'm not saying that if it's a study at Yale that it doesn't apply to students at Harvard. That's not what I'm saying. But I want you to at least make the case for why it would generalize. And it's an easy one. For a study of students at Yale, students at Harvard are pretty similar. They have, like, almost all the same demographics. The fact that they're at Yale versus Harvard, probably arbitrary. So, if we want to kind of think about this more broadly, and it's less arbitrarily, um, so here's my less arbitrary rule of thumb for how to think about generalizability. Um, if you could have participated in the study, then the results most likely generalize to you. Um, if, now you can, the next step here is kind of a slightly more thoughtful rule, is if the reasons that you couldn't have generalized, couldn't have participated in the study are unrelated to the findings of that study, then the results probably generalize to you. So, now this is all built on the assumption that you have an internally valid study. So given that your study is sound in itself, then you can ask these questions about the broader scope. Now, this approach can be applied to groups other than yourself. I just find it helpful, at least when I'm thinking about, okay, does this, is this going to make a meaningful difference in my life? I start asking, okay, but does it apply to me? And then next, if I'm thinking about, okay, how can this help other people? Or how can this, I can apply this to my own work? Then I just swap out me for another group. So... So um, I decided to cut it short right here and I'm going to talk about this example of the doctor's study next time on this video because I kind of gave up on the camera here. As you can see, I'm looking more and more defeated. So I'll see you next time and thanks for watching.